I'm happy to join you. St. Paul's is a, a special place to me. I, some of you uh, I've met before, but I actually uh, was on the staff here for three years. I was their first liturgy coordinator. Uh, I was on the staff here for three years. I got married in 1977, right there. Uh, and, and a long uh, history and, and, and love uh, this, this chapel, the this, this students, and it's been a big part of my life, even though not so much lately. My wife Kathy is a professor at the University of Wisconsin here. She teaches at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, if any of you had her, I hope you passed. <laughs> um, besides the, uh, some of those personal things, the, the, this place is also special because, as you know, I'm with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, and we've had a great conference here uh, for the last 10 years or so, but it had a history. This, this uh, Newman Center was the site of the first uh, a conference on a, a student campus in the country uh, that wasn't a religious institution uh, way back in the 1930s. And, uh, so it's a great history to addition. Actually, at lunch today, when we reformed a conference, it was at an Alpha O uh, Bible study that a group of them were actually reading from James and said, that spectrum works. <laughs> and they reformed the Society of St. Vincent de Paul after it had been inactive probably for 25 years or so. And I actually had lunch with Father Dave Crono today, who was one of the original re-founder members of the conference here at St. Paul. And I did home visits to him in the houses of the poor out on the Allied Drive for, for a whole year. So uh, the, the energy here and, and God's grace is with us. And, and it's a place where we can meet the poor, even when we're students, and, because they're around us. Um, I want to start off with a, a little bit of grounding. You've been talking about Catholic social teaching, and if you all have the handout, uh, on the top it, it, it is the text that comes from the uh, Sharing Catholic Social Teaching document of the U.S. Catholic Conference. On the very last reference, I put the website where you can have more of the data and information about it, because I'm really not going to use the catechism, and I'm really not going to use the bishop's documents much. Um, we're going to look at some stories in the gospel. But uh, the, the church and its social teaching talks about a preferential option for the poor. Uh, and it puts us to put first the needs of the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, we're so blessed to have Pope Francis, aren't we? And, and, uh, and his love for the poor, you know, it's been in all the popes, certainly, but I think he, he wears it on his sleeves. And, and it really reminds us of all of this preferential option for the poor. So on the sheet, uh, tonight's going to be both uh, listening to the words uh, of the Pope, but also the patron of St. Vincent de Paul. And the, the young college, our, our St. Vincent de Paul Society was actually started by college students in 1833 at the Sorbonne in, in response to looking for a way to put their faith in action after the revolution in France. Uh, so we're going to hear a little bit from one of the founders, but I'm going to ask us all together uh, to read the words of Pope Francis. So please join me with that. For us Christians, love of the neighbor is strange to the love of God, and it is the most clear expression. Here we are to love the most neighbor, but also to allow the self to be loved by the most neighbor. So there's this marvelous two way street, you know, that we sometimes think we're always giving to the poor, right? But the poor give it right back to us. And, and St. Vincent de Paul uh, also talked about that love of God, the love of neighbor. He said, O oh Lord, enable me to put your love into practice, filling me with true affection for you, for my neighbor, and also for myself. I think that last little phrase is important, isn't it? If you don't love yourself, how can you believe that God loves you? Sometimes they all go together. But you also have to uh, make sure that as you're loving your neighbor as yourself, if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love your neighbor very well, are you? So we've got to make sure that we're in tune with God's grace and God's love so that if we love ourselves and we love our neighbor as ourselves, uh, we express great love. Let's read the next uh, paragraph from the Holy Father. Poverty is understood in the humble, the poor, the sick, and all those who are on and more and more, I learned we'll tell, tell some stories as we get in the middle of it. You know, it's easy to talk about the poor. Sometimes it's very negative when you see our politicians doing that all 
the time, right? You know, and they don't know the poor. You read something, you think, well, who do you know that's poor? Uh, but on the other side, it's also easy to idealize who they are. And they're not always an ideal bunch. But then again, neither are your roommates or doormates, I bet, either. Neither are your family members. So why would you expect that the poor would be better than those people? And so we really get grounded to who humanity is as we get to know, especially the poor. And our founder, Bresset Friedrich Ozenam, was very aware of this. And he wrote this actually um, in 1848. It was part of talking about the politics of the time. And I could ask Tom, who's the president of our conference down here at St. Paul's, to read these words from our founder. I think there's enough. The knowledge of social well-being and reform is to be learned, not from books, not from the public platform, but in climbing the stairs to the poor man's garret, sitting by his bedside, feeling the same cold that pierces him, sharing the secrets of his lonely heart and troubled mind. When the conditions of the poor have been examined, everywhere God has placed them. It is then that we know the elements of that formidable problem that will that we begin to grasp it and may hope to solve it. And that's what Frederick and his young friends did. You know, they didn't just talk about poverty, and that's actually how we were started. They were discussing poverty all the time, and they were arguing about uh, religion and, and politics, and finally they just understood they had to go experience it. They had to go visit the poor in their homes. And this uh, goes all the way through Frederick's life. He was a professor, and he ran for public office. He was a newspaper editor. This little uh, piece was in an article in a newspaper that he wrote. So in this section, let's read one more quote from the Holy Father, and then we'll start looking at the gospel. I believe that yes, the time So we, to understand our vocation and our call to serve, we need to look to Jesus, right? Uh, and so I have a little sheet there with some scripture quotes, and it, 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 we're on the fast version tonight, so we're not going to read any of these. But uh, take them home and think about them so, uh, and reference them. Uh, I don't know about you, but I went through 12 years of Catholic school and, and did all the training. But, Throughout that whole process, the corporal works of mercy certainly were there. We understood that we needed to uh, serve the poor, but nothing was ever very concrete uh, about that. And I, I almost got the feeling, you know, as I look back, that the way doing works for the poor, feeding the hungry, collecting clothes maybe for a clothes drive, doing all the things that were presented in terms of serving the poor, were like the extra credit problems in the back of the book. You know, so if you were a B student and you couldn't quite make it, if you did a couple of those things, maybe you could get an A or a better grade. And I think sometimes we, we look at our work uh, with the poor like that, that it's really not essential. It's not the mainstream of our Catholic or Christian faith, but it's kind of the extra credit. Guys like me needed a little help, so I probably had to do more of it than some of you all. But, um, but it really isn't that way at all. Uh, certainly the Catholic social teaching talks about it being central to our faith life. And so I have this page that I just want to walk through the gospel and, and see it's very evident that this is really at the heart of what Jesus lived and taught. Right from the start, if we read the lovely uh, Magnificat, the Annunciation of Mary we celebrated a couple of days ago, right in the heart of that, you know, he fills the starving with good things, sends the rich way up to That's one of the main praises she had for, for the Lord and her acceptance of it. You know, so before Jesus, or right when Jesus is conceived, his mom is, is talking about what God does for the poor, fills the starving with good things, sends the rich way empty. Uh, then his nativity, of course, you know, it's 
easy to make a nice crash and all, but it was a barn. <laughs> it was a stinky barn for someone who was a domestic immigrant, not in their hometown. They were from Chicago. They got here and there were no hotel rooms, no place to stay, so they didn't even have room at Grace Episcopal shelter for them. They were staying in, you know, someone's garage that night. And it wasn't just a garage with a smelly oil and car, there were animals there. That's poverty. That's where he was born. And people showed that hospitality. <clears throat> Beginning his public ministry, the great line uh, in Luke, uh, where it's basically his mission statement, he, he reads from Isaiah. Again, talking about being uh, that person that brings hope to the poor, release to the captives. And we've all read that many times. But that's where Jesus starts his mission. And they throw him out for it, too. It's not the Savior they were looking for, uh, but it is who he was. So we start getting this picture right from the start of who he is. He tells us pretty clearly what he's going to do, who he is. We look at the teachings, uh, uh, some of the basic ones that we all look at. And you've heard great sermons on all these topics. I'm not going to give it to you. I just want to bunch it all together so you can see there's an overwhelming evidence in the gospel that we ought to look at this. The Good Samaritan, you know, the rich young man. Uh, and, and he asks, who is my neighbor? And what does he tell him? And it's a stranger, someone who was attacked, someone who was a foreigner, didn't believe the same way. Nothing that the priests did or the lawyers did was wrong, actually, if you've heard about you know, the purity laws and, the <coughs> and maybe good reasons why they didn't do it. But that was the neighborhood. Jesus tells us the neighborhood. Lazarus and the rich man, another story. Someone who didn't recognize the poor right in front of them. Uh, and of course, you know, in case you had any doubt uh, about uh, the importance of it, Jesus gives us the parable of the goats and the sheep. And all the things he could have told us about, oh, I'm going to get into heaven, or not get into heaven. Uh, there's a lot of things I think we all know are really important for our own personal salvation we got to do. But he didn't spend a lot of time talking about did that. Uh, he said, you had to feed your neighbor, uh, you had to clothe your neighbor, visit the sick in prison. Uh, and then finally, um, he was convicted as a criminal, uh, died on a cross, and buried in a borrowed grave, uh, which we know he rose from. Pretty clear, right? <laughs> Not going to spend a lot of time about it. So, but that's our vocation. I'm just ask you to think about it. Where do we go from that? It's the next thing. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about this. I don't want to have you all leaving depressed or thinking that, <laughs> that you're never going to measure up, uh, because that's far from the truth. I start with uh, a reminder of the mystical body of Christ. Uh, we're not all called to do the same thing. Uh, I uh, probably had an affinity and a love for the poor that came through my grandparents who were poor themselves. Uh, great stories I didn't even appreciate till later on. I'll, my grandpa was a teacher, and a uh, male teacher in the 20s didn't make a lot of money. There weren't many of them. And, uh, he had eight kids in a Catholic family. Um, he finally had to quit that, but they were so poor that uh, they had, their family was in Oshkosh, and when they would take their Model T there, literally the local chief of police would let my grandpa borrow the license plate so he could get pulled over driving from Wisconsin Rapids to Oshkosh. But not only did they have poverty in their family, and I never experienced any of that, my dad did, uh, but I also had an aunt and an uncle uh, who were severely mentally retarded. And I grew up in the town where they were the laughing stock of Wisconsin Rapids. And as a result, so was I. <laughs> Rose and Ray and Ralph, you know, so I, uh, and so that was something I could see a different kind of poverty, right? And, uh, but it also taught me, I loved them. They would play stupid card games with a six-year-old all night long, no one else would, right? Uh, they had songs to sing, stories to tell. Uh, I loved them. And even though I was laughed at through high school, um, I, I knew about uh, a different kind of poverty. Um, so when I was here at St. Paul's, uh, I witnessed certainly mental illness, but mental illness uh, in this neighborhood is added with alcohol and drug use, right? Um, and a lot of the people that we see are drinkers really have a mental illness. They're dual diagnosis. A lot of them don't want to take their medicine. They'd rather drink alcohol. And, and it's 
a long story why that is. But so I started meeting people with mental illness, but also all of a sudden there's a whole other issue going on. And I found out um, I liked working with that population. I felt comfortable. Uh, and it's where I started some of the journey that led me to my role at St. Vincent de Paul. We eventually started the meal program downstairs that now is at Luke House. Uh, I was, I, after I was Liberty coordinator here and got married, I started a bookstore. All of a sudden I was feeding bum sandwiches. All of a sudden I was feeding 30 bum sandwiches. And we started a meal program. Uh, I was comfortable with that group. You might not be. Um, and you shouldn't do it if that's not what you do. I think that the mystical body of Christ tells us we all have gifts. I could sit in an emergency room or waiting for some guy to sober up for a court appointment, you know, get him up early in the morning and do that. That's okay. It was at least at that time. Um, put me in front of a classroom of fifth grade CCD kids on a Saturday morning, I'm climbing the walls. I'm hot here. <laughs> right? I have friends that tell me my dad, who was a Boy Scout leader, kept them out of prison for life. And that probably was more important than a lot of things I ever did. Uh, you've got parents that have stories like that. You know people like that. It is, isn't all just you know, the things that I do or other people do or Mother Teresa does or whatever. You've got to call, figure out who it is. They're poor around you. Uh, little children is one thing Francis does. Yes, how about old people? Uh, one point, my mom and dad were in Wisconsin Rapids. They were in bad health. I'm down here. I used to get up there. Oh, once a month. I guess I had to actually do all their grocery shopping from here. Uh, once a month, Mom was good at making the list and I would get it all. But there's sometimes I had gaps, and she had hard conversation once with me. She said, Ralph, you spend a lot of your time and you don't visit us. You're busy. You're doing good work down there. Um, are, are those people any more deserving of your time than we are? Um, are they any poorer or any needier than her? And that was hard to have your own mother tell you that. My own mother gave me an examination of conscience <laughs> that I needed. <laughs> I was happily serving meals, doing all kinds of other stuff, not driving to Wisconsin Rapids and spending time with my own parents. So those are important parts of the body of Christ. You're placed with a certain set of gifts. Don't try to be using someone else's gifts. But also don't hide those. Don't feel like it exempts you. That's someone else's problem. That's something I don't need to do. Um, sometimes the fellows you meet on the street, young women at night, you probably shouldn't be approaching them, helping them, taking them out to eat, doing stuff. You can smile at them though, that's okay. I've heard from more people that are street people, homeless people, that one of the most painful things is that they just get ignored. And I find sometimes, I get a warm smile back from some guys, they just, they try to sell me the little newspaper, right? I just smile and say, oh, no thanks, you know. But, but I, 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 at least acknowledge they existed. And sometimes that's one of the bigger pains. As you get to know the poor too, there, there's so many different kinds. And, and, and I think part of what our faith teaches us is that we need to love people first. We can't judge them. We need to love them first. And one of the harder populations, we've got like four main kind of categories of people living in poverty in Madison. A newer one that's going to be seen a lot is just senior elderly. We never made enough money. Their social security is going to be six to $800, that doesn't pay the rent even. So another group certainly is the alcoholic street people. Another group is, we see a lot of publicity about people who moved here from Chicago, right? Um, little story, and then a whole other group is people coming out of prison. These are four distinct groups of people with needs that put them in poverty. Um, a little word about some of the women's Salvation Army though, because I think it's really easy to judge people that, three, four children, none of them the same father, maybe they're living with a guy now, not married. It's not right. You know, we should never say it's right. I was up at the Salvation Army, though, um, two Saturdays ago uh, with a friend of mine who works a lot with that group in the schools, and a couple of us were just, why not to be present and visit and learn from them as before we try solving problems and things like Tell us your story. What's going on? We talked to six women, one with a man living with her who was actually married which is not the typical thing, but they were married, they're living there, to a person. Five of them were from Chicago, one from Florida. They all came to Madison to escape violence. Violence. Told stories of from the time they were 14 years old to be raped, sometimes gang raped, regularly. They didn't want that for their kids. They didn't want it for themselves. There were drugs in the community. That's why they came here. 
Some of them had babies at 14, 15, whatever, because if you didn't find one man, you were victim to all men. So they picked the one, had babies with them. Did what we call sinful. We know it's not right, but until I can figure out what justice can do so there's no longer schoolgirls, high school girls, girls my friend knows going to Catholic schools that this is their life. Um, out of justice, we've got to solve the problem. We can't just say they've got to live a for a faithful part of life. We also are, have a, 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 a corporate responsibility. And that's what this preferential option of the poor, that's what the social teachers tell us. It's not just handing out food baskets. At some point, we need to have this stop. We can't ask some of these people to, by themselves, just not do this stuff when they're in these situations. So there are frightful systematic injustice right at our own doorsteps. Guys coming back from prison lots of times, they sold drugs, yeah. Um, they maybe didn't have fathers at home in this gang. It was the closest thing they were going to have to an adult role model, and they pushed them into something that was terrible. It's wrong. I'll never say things weren't wrong. Don't do that. But they were. Uh, but where's the system of justice? We need to work on that, too. They both go together. Um, so listening to the poor, not assuming we have all the answers. Like when we started the meal program downstairs, one of the guys I did a lot of work with, he was a real jerk, quite frankly, pain in the neck. Uh, so we had their first meal, we had it all set up, the line comes this way, you eat your food, you go out that door, and he went out the wrong door, just flagrantly went out the wrong door. We said, oh, look, he sent this up, come on, this. Oh yeah, now you're gonna make bums jump through hoops for jelly sandwiches, aren't you? Uh, but it tells us often when we help the poor, we think we have all the answers. We don't ask them, and we need to involve them as we get to love them a little more, know them, don't necessarily have our solutions to their problems always. They appreciated the soup we served that day. But they also want to be included uh, in, in some of that decision making. And so uh, getting to know love the poor, getting to know their stories, getting to know your own stories. One last thing before we um, talk, uh, do the closing uh, uh, comments from Pope Francis, which will kind of act as a closing prayer as well. This. A lot of times, there's nothing you can do. And that's a poverty in itself, because we're all smart, young, well, most of us Anglo-Saxon. And one of the poverties I've had to learn, you know, I'm executive of St. Vincent of Paul. We have thousands of dollars we spend it for. And there are many times I sit down with someone who tells me a horrible story. And I just have to say, I can't do anything. Some, you really deserve someone to do something for you. And, and that's my poverty. Uh, We've got our own poverties that we need to embrace, too. And so the poor help us see that. The poor help us see that uh, we have not been given all the grace. And so at the end of the day, um, they give me a lot to pray about. <laughs> they give me a lot to be humble about. It gives me a lot of reason to say to that uh, it really is in God's hands. Um, St. Vincent Paul, my, one of my great role models, it's been said about him that he would say, who is the poorest person that Vincent ever met. He met a lot, he would say himself. Uh, and the poor help us see that too, right? That we all need that grace of God uh, to continue uh, to faithfully live it. And I think the poor in the gospel, the reason that Jesus has us rub shoulders with them, it keeps us honest. You know, it reminds us that this iPhone isn't the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's not uh, a lot of other things. Uh, there are other good people struggling they keep us centered. So let us take that sheet and, uh, on the top. Uh, just read together this for Pope Francis, and then we've got maybe five, ten minutes for conversation. Is that better? Okay. Together then. What is the law of the people of God? It is the law of love.
like this is the heart of the gospel. Like you said, the parable of the or not the parable, but like the final judgment. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats based on basically how the good works that he did in life, and how he did serve the poor, clothe the naked, um, and feed the hungry. So I guess my question is, maybe in people you have crossed who like, I don't know, what is the number one or two thing that's keeping us from doing that? What's what's stopping us from really serving the poor? Um, well, sometimes it's just not knowing what to do, right? Some of us want to. There's groups like, you know, same as Nepal, you know, if you're looking for something, join when they're in the bulletin. Uh, some of it's, though, our own unwillingness to let go. You know, we want it both ways. We want it all. And it's um, it, uh, just not uh, just a material matter. It's a spiritual matter. At some point, um, the stuff gets in the way of our spiritual life. It isn't just making the mass on time. Uh, it, it's also a matter of being vulnerable. Some, some, sometimes it's giving yourself. Sometimes it's just being willing to go out there a little bit and to really listen to someone and to sit there. Like I sat with those women at the Salvation Army, I just listen. Yeah, I, you know, occasionally, I, what, what can I say? I didn't live that life. But that's where you have to start sometimes and figure out where you put your oar in the water. No one right answer, but uh, and it's important to just throwing the can in the can drive. At some points, you go through stages of life too. You know, you're a student now. Maybe it's not a lot you can do. Get the best education you can, but land yourself in a place that that has that you can express those values. Raise good kids. Uh, you know, how many you know, uh, people are out there troubled and are all these situations? You know, they didn't have the mom and dad I did. <laughs> so be those moms and dads during the time, and then. Later on, there's something else you got to do. Yes? So Jesus talks a lot about providing shelter, clothing, and food. Um, and these are things that people ask of us uh, yes. a lot. Um, could you outline some principles um, for how we know when we're supposed to take uh, Jesus' commandment literally? And sure. Sure. Good question. Because down here you're front costed all the time when people would hand out, you know, and asking. Uh, some of the shelter stuff, it's just not, you don't have to give. And you're putting your own self in danger. So I would never uh, provide shelter, but I would certainly politically support it when the city of Madison is working to get shelters. You know, tell your older person, this is important to you. Um, you know, Sometimes people are going to have to pay a little more taxes in their life. And we're so afraid to pay a little more taxes. I'd rather pay a little more taxes, do a few more things, and not have to walk down State Street seeing the misery that I see, to not have people jammed in what were meant to be classrooms at uh, the old St. Pat's School up there that's now the Salvation Army Shelter. Um, so we're willing to do that um, on a shelter level. There's not a lot you can do. Uh, even putting up in hotel rooms, St. Vincent Paul doesn't even hardly do that anymore. Unless we really got to know the person and know that this is the answer for a short time. Um, but that's a relationship. Food. Um, I, one thing, if you, look, if you want to provide some stuff, there's nothing wrong with going and getting a few gift cards uh, from one of the eateries in, in the area. And if you are so inclined, maybe put a little of that in your budget. And if you see someone you think you're would like they're asking for food, but don't give them the buck, you know, give them the gift card. If it's something that you really feel comfortable with, and, and I know people who've done it who are students, you know, take them into one of the places and eat lunch with them. You'll hear a good story sometimes. And sometimes it is a story, don't get me wrong. But if you're comfortable, never do something that you think there's a danger factor. But if someone, be, uh, this one guy I was telling you was the pain in the neck of the meal program, he told me at one point when we started the meal, he says, I have lots of ways I can get a drink. But uh, when I get sandwiches, I take them out of the dumpsters a lot. Because you know, I'm so driven to get them. So if someone gave them food, he was generally grateful. But sometimes, maybe you have gift cards. Sometimes, maybe you say, gee, I got an hour before the class. I'm going to eat. Let's go to Canova together. Will you do that? If they say no, fine. They may be uncomfortable, too, <laughs> and scared. But sometimes they'll take you up. And that's great. Um, clothing. 
We'll have clothing drives through the spring. You know, make sure we got barrels in your church that say this ball. We give away two hundred fifty thousand dollars of clothes out of St. Vincent Paul stores, right off the racks. You don't even necessarily know that the person ahead of you is getting those clothes. Uh, we do with the voucher system. So uh, there's, there's clothes available. Food at our food pantry. We will give a million and a half dollars worth of food away to people in need in the community, and we're not the only ones doing that. So there's bread, there's food, there's stuff available. Maybe inconvenient, there's meal programs, but sometimes they need it right here. They can't walk that far. They, sometimes they don't even have, I've, when I first started, I was just shocked. I used to pack the food in pantry baskets. I had guys that I knew were kind of homeless who just got a place, and every so often I had the intuition to just ask me, it was a providential grace, do you have a can up there? I just packed them a bag full of cans. And they said, no. So I throw out a can over. But I mean, some, you know, just, you know, even at that level, some people don't have the resources. But, um, so give to the institutions as well as put yourself up on someone. Never give money. It's always going to go to booze. I guarantee you. Well, maybe 95% of the time, it's going to go to booze. And they'll pool their money together until they can buy a bottle, most likely. Sometimes the people with mental handicaps, we need to get them on the benefits they deserve to have, which is an SSDI, which can take up to two years in this political environment uh, without it. There are, there's a job center out at Aberg Avenue. If someone's sober and wanting to do it, it's a long road. It can take months to do it, but, but there are opportunities. Uh, the problems in Madison is the high cost of housing. It's not just the unavailability of jobs. And the big politics are, are such that we sent a lot of jobs overseas to, you know, the, I worked at a factory every summer in Wisconsin Rapids, uh, same one my father did. They made stoves for Sears. Those stoves for Sears are now made in Mexico. You know, and if a dumb college kid like me could help make stoves and make 11 bucks an hour, a lot of the folks I've seen certainly could have too, but those jobs left. And that's something we have to live with and face. It's, and a lot of them are not educated or ready to get those other jobs. So keeping kids in school, getting them, and, and some of it's just being persistent. I don't know what we do about housing. Um, one of the problems is, um, you know, to get anything, you have to have at least like $800 or so, uh, plus utility bills. And there are a lot of people that even if they're working, that's about what they're getting. So they're going to still have to eat at meal programs. They're still going to have to ask for help now and then. Fortunately, the health care thing is going to help them. You know, there's a lot of controversy around it, but to the people I see, it's a good thing. Good question. Good. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks so much for a very great presentation. Uh, we're going to get right into the announcements here. All right. So there's some upcoming service opportunities. Um, St. Vincent's to Falls Food Pantry, so you can help out with that Saturday, March 29th from 8 to 12. Uh, also, Salvation Army Soup Kitchen, Sunday, March 30th, from 10.30 to 2, um, as well as Arboretum Cleanup, I believe, for Ecological Restoration, uh, Saturday, March 29th, from 9 to 12. And tomorrow, Friday, from 3 to 6, uh, you can help out at the CMC Food Pantry. So there's a lot of stuff you can do to help the poor, obviously. I believe you can